Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. The podcast where we limp like Greg Edinger and Brian Broom has returned. Huzzah! <laughs> and there was much rejoicing. Uh, so to bring you up to speed, Brian, we have been talking about Gideon, um, how he had grown up in the world of Baal and Ashtaroth, where magical means rule the day, rule the thought processes. Um, we're talking about the forces of nature, people manipulating the forces of nature. In fact, there was a an altar to Baal on Gideon's father's property. So that's who he is. And then he is called by God to defeat the Midianites. And he asks the Lord for a sign. Not angel feathers, not golden sparkles, but he asks God for a sign to show his involvement in the everyday things, that God has the the power and the involvement in each little thing to be a sovereign personal God. Um, he's not just another force of nature to manipulate. Mm -hmm. And God graciously gives him that sign with the fleece. And that's what we talked about last week. Does that make sense, Brian? I kind yes. of... Okay, good. No, that makes sense because we're, cool. we're talking about the difference between Yahweh and the other, the pagan gods who are manipulable. Manipulable? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. And um, that that Jehovah is not because mm -hmm. he is the one that upholds the universe. Cool. And awesome. governs it in all of its parts and pieces, mm -hmm. including yeah. fleeces. Including fleeces and the dew that falls each morning. Mm-hmm. On the righteous and the unrighteous. All right, so today we are moving on. What happens at the battle? Well, before we get to the battle, okay, God doesn't want Israel trusting in their own strength. And so he does a winnowing process. Oh, Gideon yes. has an army of about 32,000 men, which is barely a quarter of the size of Midian's army. And yet God tells him he's got too many soldiers. And that if they defeated Midian as it was, they take all the credit. So, first of all, they follow biblical law, which says that you're not supposed to have any cowards on your army. So, they're told anybody who's afraid can go home. And 22,000 men went home. <laughs> not a lot of faith going on here. But God still wasn't satisfied. He set up a special test. He had Gideon bring his army to, um, to some water. And some people knelt down. And, and splattered, splattered their face in the water and drank, and others uh, brought the water to their mouths with their hands. And I've heard speculations about what the difference is. Uh, the text doesn't actually say, and for our purposes, we can just go on and say, when Gideon was done, he only had 300 people left. And God says, cool, now we can do stuff. <laughs> God's like that. God gives Gideon a battle plan. And here I will I will read a little bit of it. And he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. So they've got burning lamps, but they're covered by pitchers, so they won't be extinguished, but no one can see them at a distance. And everybody has trumpet. And he says, do what I do. So when I blow with a trumpet... And everyone who's with me, and all of you blow with trumpets on every side of the camp and yell out the sword of the Lord of Gideon. That's the first part. And so they wait till the middle of the night and they, they spread out. And in the, the middle watch, when they had but newly set the next watch, then Gideon gives a signal. So this, this is practically what's happening. Midianite Bob is just coming in from a long night of standing guard with nothing at all happening. And he's messing around in the tent, you know, dropping his armor and getting ready for a nice long night's sleep. When suddenly outside, he hears a lot of commotion because the new picket guards are yelling, uh, invasion, threat, ar army around us. Because what they have seen suddenly are lights burning all around them in a circle. <laughs> obviously, every light represents a large company of soldiers. Obviously. They're, obviously, they're thinking. So they suddenly realize their encampment is surrounded. 
And they begin yelling and screaming, we're surrounded, we're in trouble. And everybody in the camp starts yelling this. And so the people in the tents, uh, Bob's friend Ned, who has been sleeping all this time, wakes up and hears, um, we're surrounded, the enemy's here. And he looks and sees someone moving around in his tent. Being groggy, <laughs> Ned reaches, fumbles around for his sword and stabs Bob through the gut, thinking that he is an Israelite. Bob returns the favor, swinging toward his head, and this is happening throughout the whole camp. People are thrown off because there are people moving in the camp, because the guard just got off duty, uh, and they, no one can see. It's the middle of the night. No one can see anything. And so suddenly they're all fighting each other. And God tipped the scales. It says that God set every man's hand against, or every man's sword against his fellow. And so the battle began amongst themselves while Israel sort of stood there and thought, huh. So <laughs> lights and trumpets and shouts, a very faint replica of the glory cloud mm -hmm. uh, entrusted to God's own people. They, at this point, they hadn't done anything except yell, call on God and break some pitchers. And, yeah. <laughs> break some pottery. Earthen uh, vessels. Earthen vessels, yes. There, I, I was talking to to Brian about this, well, both of you earlier about this. There is a, um, was, I think he was a lieutenant colonel in in the army during the Korean War. He wrote one of the first books on psychological warfare. His name was Paul Leinbarger. Some people may know him by his pen name, Cordwainer Smith, under which he wrote a number of, to my mind, rather bizarre science fiction novels. But when you read them, there is a, a hint of his Christianity in the background. Uh, but anyway, Paul Einberger, in writing about psychological warfare, borrowed this chapter from Gideon and said, look, let's see how this fits in. And he, he pointed out, well, first of all, you pick the time. Time is very important here. You pick the time when one group of soldiers is brand new and they haven't settled in yet. The other guards have are going back to their tents and taking off their armor and making a little a small amount of noise, trying not to wake up their friends. And then you deceive the enemy with all of these trumpets and lights, which they assume must represent large numbers of men, when in fact they represent just a couple guys each. Uh, and you get the, the your enemy worked up, confused. And you wake up the soldiers who are sleeping in their tents, and they see people coming back. And they see dark figures moving around the tents. And so they draw their swords and swing. The returning guards try to protect themselves. The battles carry out, out of the tent into the, into the uh, area between the tents. And everybody suddenly realizes the battle is going on all around them. And they can't tell who's who. And anybody running at you probably is an enemy. So I need to kill them too. And he makes a big deal out of all this. Here's a Christian using the Bible in a very esoteric field of human study. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. But he, he thought this was important enough to include in, in his major book on the subject. Anyway, for whatever He's a was. Christian writing about psychological warfare? Yeah. That's like an interesting concept in itself. It is. Of like, it, Christians can participate in psychological warfare, <laughs> or at least they do. Yeah, at least they do. He did. Uh, and also write sci-fi, which is a topic probably for next week. Yeah, we'll talk about that next week. Well, anyway, so the Midianites run. The host fled from the Sheeta in uh, Zerorath and to the border of El Abel uh, Moholat and to Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Naphtali, out of Asher, out of Manasseh, and pursued. Them. So all the people who got sent home now realize hey, we should be in this. This looks like we're going to win. So they follow. Get in this. Just in passing, Gideon sends messengers to uh, Ephraim and says, uh, come take the um, the waters into Bethbara and Jordan. Basically, take the place where the, these Midianites are going to try to cross the Jordan. Now, Ephraim was descended from Joseph. And we all remember Joseph. He was the, the, the obedient son, the cool son, the godly son who had dreams and prophecies. And he's the guy who's... Seems to be the hero of the last few chapters of Genesis. And we kind of. Technicolor dream coat. Yeah, that. 
and and we kind of assume that he's going to be the one who carries the promise because he's uh, the he's, good son. He's the good son. Uh, interestingly enough, God's not interested in that as he is in something else. That's a story for another time. Anyway, the promise goes to Judah. Um, and the Ephraimites from that point on, although they got, although Joseph got a double portion, double inheritance, his sons Ephraim and Manasseh splitting it, so two tribes for one, they are not granted the leadership. And Ephraim from here on rankles at that. They kind of think they should be leading. And this carries all the way into the book of Kings where Ephra, or, um, Jeroboam I comes from Ephraim and the division between Judah and the other tribes takes place within one of the Ephraimite towns. But this is where we, we see it beginning. Uh, the men of Ephraim had not put themselves out there. They hadn't acted like leaders, but they, they do go to the forts and they capture the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and um, take off their heads. But in chapter 8 of Judges, they then turn on Gideon and say, why didn't you call us to fight? Now, the obvious response would be, I did, and you didn't <laughs> come. But Gideon decides, and it's, it's sort of built into his character as we've seen it so far. He's not aggressive. And rather than try that line, he tries another. He says, what have I done in comparison with you? I mean, we've taken sure we've taken out some field soldiers, but you got the cream of the crop. You got the the best grapes in the in the vineyard. Uh, his line uh, is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Ebenezer. That is of his own his own hope. Yeah, you only got a few, but the stuff you gleaned was so precious considering compared to the garbage we got. You should be really proud of yourselves. And apparently they, hey, hey, he's right. Yeah, we ought to be proud of ourselves. They start high-fiving each other. And that satisfies them, apparently, for now. But we're going to see them again in the days of uh, Jephthah, where they're not so easily mollified. Anyway, Gideon continues to pursue. And we'll skip some of the details. He, he gets not a lot of help from people along the way. And he deals with that later. But eventually catches up with the kings. The Ephraimites took out some of the princes, but there's still two kings. They're called Zeba and Zalmona. And he I almost said arrest them, but that's kind of it. Takes them captive. <laughs> and then this is what happens. It says, um, this is verse 18. He said to Zeba and Salmona, what manner of men were they whom you slay, whom you slew at Tabor? And they answered, as thou art, so were they, each one. It resembled the children of a king. <laughs> they okay. were just like you, so handsome and strong and kind and merciful. Exactly. But then they don't, that doesn't get the response. They, they played the card wrong on the wrong hand. And because he says, they were my brethren. We haven't had any hint of this before, but apparently he's telling the truth. Even the sons of my mother. So they were the family on the mom's side. As the Lord liveth, if you would save them alive, I would not slay you. Oh, wait. This is a life to death, life and death battle against Baalism, against the Midianites, against the enemies of Jehovah. What do you mean you would not have slain them because of a purely personal family issue? That doesn't sound good. But it goes further. He says to Jether, his firstborn, up and slay them. Now, his, from what we're going to see, his son had not been very active in the battle, if at all. He, he hadn't really swung a sword or, or done anything like that. And yet Gideon's pushing him forward to kill kings. So again, mm. there seems to be a little bit of family pride. I want my son to be known as the man who killed these kings. Gideon doesn't care about himself so much, but it's important that his boy be known to be a man and a king killer and conqueror and all that stuff. Unfortunately for Gideon, the youth drew not his sword, for he feared, because he was a youth, <laughs> maybe a teenager. And then Ziba and Zalmunna decide to give more advice, because they're like that. Rise thou and fall upon us, for as a man is, so is his strength. Strength referring to his firstborn. Like father, like son, why don't you show him how it's done? I do not understand their thought processes here. Maybe one of you has an idea. 
Because, of course, Gideon then dies. He kills them. They would just want to be killed by their conqueror. Or they think they're going to cow him into not doing it. I, I don't know. But for the, our basic theme tonight, we again should notice that here is Gideon. It looks like he's sidling up to the concept of a monarchy, of being an elected king of some sort, or maybe starting a, a dynasty. He wants his boy to be important. He's concerned about what's happened to his family. But when uh, push comes to shove and the individual come and say, rule thou over us, must thou and thy son and thy son's son, for you've delivered us from the hand of Midian. There's a, there is an important principle here. The one who saves you is the one who rules over you. And the thing is that Gideon wasn't the savior. Yahweh was the savior. God was their savior. God should rule over them. And, and Gideon gets that. Gideon said, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. So if the story in there, this would be great. A little bit of confusion there at the end, but Gideon's mm -hmm. made the right decision. He does not reach for the throne or the crown. And um, yeah, no, no, no dynasty. It kind of reminds me of what we were talking about. I can't remember if this was on another podcast episode or actually at Bible study, um, but where we were talking about vengeance belonging to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he's appointed an institution on earth for vengeance. In the mm -hmm. Old Testament, there was this whole system of the kinsman redeemer and the avenger, the avenger of blood. He had a job to do. Right. And we kind of see Gideon delegating this where he does not really have permission to delegate. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah, indicates, it's... you know, in if we skip over to Romans 13 and think of that in the context of vengeance as it is with the end of Romans 12 and what follows it, that's not a good start to government. <laughs> like the whole point of the government is to perform this task, and Gideon's shying away from it. Yeah, and he's and it's to perform it with an even hand, without mm -hmm. preference. Something the Mosaic Law emphasized many, many times. You don't honor the poor, you don't honor the rich. There is to be equality of justice, and and something we will run into more in Kings as we go along. When you defeat the enemy who's been trying to destroy you, you don't at the end say, well, we're both kings, you know, let's just be <laughs> good buds now and hang out together because, well, forget the rabble because kings are different. No. You take no. the existential threat seriously. <laughs> yes, you do. And you eliminate it. You, you execute the justice of God because it's not a personal matter. You know, some people, um, quite a few people actually, Look at the idea of, say, capital punishment or military expeditions and say, that's unkind, that's unloving. Well, the whole point is it's not a personal, it's not supposed to be personal. It can become mm -hmm. personal. But in a sense, it's supposed to be very emotionally neutral in that God has given me this job. I'm not doing this because I hate this guy. Uh, and, by, and therefore, by the same token, I don't get to spare him because I like him. Or because blood makes me feel icky, uh, or because I, I I can't handle violence. God has a job for the state, for the civil magistrate, and sometimes that involves pulling out a sword and running it through somebody. And the judges to do this without showing preference for one over another. If the man is guilty of a capital crime, he's to be executed. If he's not, he's not. If someone is threatening the life of a dear one and you have no other, the, the police officer, the soldier has no other alternative, no simple alternative, like, hey, stop or I'll blow your brains out, um, then he's to pull the trigger. And he's not to do it because of hatred, whether personal hatred or um, ethnic hatred, uh, bigotry of any sort. It is a matter of justice. Mm -hmm. And when we start flexing that on either end, either bringing down the wrath of the civil government on those who don't deserve it because we don't like them, or sparing the wrath of the civil government because, oh, but don't you think they meant well, and shouldn't we love our neighbor? Um, you're, you're setting the civil government up to be something it's not meant to be, and you will not get what you think you're going to get. Right. You will get something very, very dangerous because now you've released it from the bonds of God's law, 
and set it free to run in terms of human emotion, human preference, and human bigotry. And that should be frightening. Well, the story takes another turn here. Just when it sounds like it's safe, Gideon has a request. He asks that uh, they, all the soldiers, give the golden earrings that they've taken from the soldiers that they've killed or corralled. Uh, they are, um, it says they are Ishmaelites. They had intermarried apparently with the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites, being descended from a bondwoman, continue the practice of wearing earrings. The males wore earrings, which was not a common custom in Israel. That was reserved for slaves. It showed that your ear was chained to the voice of your master. It had a symbolic meaning. But the Ishmaelites and apparently some of the Midianites did that as well. So they all have these golden earrings. And Gideon says, let me have those. You want to do me something special? Forget the forget the monarchy. Just, just give me that part of the spoil. I'll take that. And they said, we will willingly give them. And they spread a garment out and did cast every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides all the other stuff he got. Okay, well, that's not bad. David later on will designate certain parts of the spoil as his, but this is what he does with it. And Gideon made an ephod thereof. An ephod is um, a cloak, a, it's, the, it's the name that's given to the high priest's uh, uniform, his dress. It includes a robe and a vest over it in which uh, jewels representing the 12 tribes are there. It also contained the mysterious Urim and Thummim, which somehow, we're not told how, give, gave yes and no answers directly from God. So he's making a replica of this, but it's all in gold. Uh, and he sets it up in his city. And this is what the text says. All Israel went thither, a whoring after it. And the thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Apparently, it's possible that it became an idol. More likely, since he made the ephod, not a golden calf or <laughs> something else. The, re the real ephod was used to communicate with God. It seems like he was making his own golden version of this. Almost as good, in some ways better, because it's shiny and glittery and contains a great deal of physical wealth from commemorating the battle. And so apparently people came there thinking they would get yes and no answers from God. In other words, to backtrack to the whole fleece issue, it became a means of divination. Mm -hmm. Whereas Gideon had not used the fleece for divination. He already knew God's will. Um this is divination. This is taking something sacred, replicating it on your own terms, and then insisting that because you've because you've made it right, because it looks like the real thing, because it has religious overtones, God obviously will respond. Remember, this whole thing was a battle over who's truly God, Jehovah or Baal, the creator or the forces of nature. And God had proved himself by miracle and special providence and all kinds of things to be the one who rules the natural order, to, who rules creation. And, and the battle had proved that. And now they turn right around and bring God down to the level of someone who can be manipulated by magic, who will buy into their magic, who will answer, answer their, questions. their questions on their terms. Yeah. Magic eight ball. Mm -hmm. Um Will I, should I marry her? Are you kidding? You know, um, <laughs> do you ever have a, were magic, were magic eight balls a thing in your times? Yeah. Do, do you know what I'm well, Mostly about? in this TV show that probably only aired for one year because I can't find it anywhere, but it was called the Angry Beavers and they had the mystical <laughs> seven ball. Um, but I think I there's also an eight ball that. in Toy Story. I you remember, remember the Angry show. Beavers? Yes. I remember it was on Nickelodeon, I think. Yeah, we thought it was the greatest thing. We didn't have cable, so we never got to see it unless we were like catching a snippet of it at somebody else's house. So it was like the greatest thing I, since sliced bread. I don't remember much about it, but it, it, it was very humorous, the things that I do remember. <laughs> the weird thing here is I had never, ever heard of it, except right? earlier this week I saw a reference to it. And what? I had no idea what it was. And I still <laughs> have no idea what it was because your explanations are it's... rather vague. Isn't it so crazy how that happens where it's yeah. like the minute you find out about something, it'll show up 
all over the place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. And yeah, what the one I love is when you're reading a book and watching TV or listening to the radio and you read a word that is not common and at the same time <laughs> the person on the television says the same word. <laughs> like, okay, that was weird. Yeah. Now you're as like, Christians okay. <laughs> As Christians, we understand this. God's got a sense of humor. He it's not a random event. God controls it. What it means in the great cosmic scheme of things, we don't know. God has a purpose and it may just be to make us smile or to remind us, hi, I'm here. Um, <laughs> this word exists. This, Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah, magic eight balls were a thing when I was a kid. They, they looked like eight balls. Um, they had some kind of liquid inside. And as you turned them, the things inside would spin around and each time up would float another message that all amounted to yes or no. Sometimes it was things like, it is certain, or try again, or... Yeah, ask me later. Ask me later, or most certainly, uh, or discouraging things like you wish. Um, <laughs> don't count on it. Don't oh. count on it. So that's kind of what these people were doing to God. Or you can think of rolling dice or tarot cards or I Ching sticks or reading bird's livers or the... I, I was reading something else, and I remember what it was now, but it was just a whole list of all of the things that the, the pagan world used. Oh, it was a commentary. It was a commentary name. That oh, they I used. was going to ask if it was D.S. <laughs> Eliot's Four Quartets. Well, I've been reading theology lately. Oh, that would be it. <laughs> um, just, just a list of things that the pagan world consulted to see what God was going to do next. And I found a new one, actually, in reading the commentaries on AM. Cloud formation. I'd never heard that one before. Hmm. There were people yeah. whose special office was to watch clouds, note how they formed, and make predictions about the future in terms of it. It sounds like an Avatar episode. But the other thing we need to remember in this context is that for we think the Christian worldview has settled on the West enough that we think of time as a fixed stream running forward and that the person with the crystal ball or whatever is looking down a more or less settled view, a timeline where things are set and just simply seeing the future. Uh, the pagan world saw the seeing as determining, generating, mm -hmm. creating. This is why when Balaam was hired to prophesy against Israel. He's, the word that's used repeatedly is divination. We would say fortune telling. What is fortune telling? Uh, for, well, fortune telling is going to tell you that God has planned for his people. That's not, it's not what you want. But that's, it was more than that. It was by seeing the future, you can cast it into a certain, you can, you can actually manipulate the powers of nature. Speak it into existence. And speak it into existence. You can generate the future. Uh, and in this regard, it's not too far from some of the early scientists, uh, the post-Christian scientists who thought, well, if we know all the starting factors and all the conditions and all the natural laws, we can predict the future and we can then set about manipulating the future in our present. <laughs> the psycho-historian. Uh, yeah. And here, and here we can uh, go to the Foundation series by Asimov, which is coming out as a movie and I have oh. no hopes at all for it. <laughs> <laughs> Although I hear Dune is really good. Anyhow, so this is what's going on. And not only does Israel generally get caught up in this, we're told it was a snare to Gideon and to his house. And it's hard to it's hard to put this together because we know the writer of Hebrews lists Gideon among the champions of faith and the things he has done so far are by faith. And when the spirit came upon him, he fought the Lord's battle. His nickname means... Uh, the guy who brings down Baal, more or less, Baal, let Baal plead. And yet he falls in some way into this great sin. And we don't know if there was ever repentance. We look at Solomon and we see his horrible sins. And yet we have the book of Ecclesiastes that sort of hints that in the end of his life, he got turned around. So, but it doesn't even end there. Uh, the country does have rest for 40 years. And Gideon goes home. He doesn't make a big spectacle of himself, except he has three score and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Okay, no. 
That's a lot. <laughs> that's 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 a lot. We're not told how many concubines, but to produce seventy sons, it's a lot. <laughs> that's a few. Yeah, I, I, I'm wondering here. Um, you know, Solomon had a thousand wives, and as far as we can tell, he only had one son. There's nobody else listed. Um, Gideon sounds like he was deliberately setting out to have children. Uh, this. Just because you have lots of wives doesn't mean ask ask the Mormons and the and the uh, <laughs> you know the Apostolic Mormon cults the fundamentalists they have lots of wives they don't generally produce seventy sons in you know your brood so this this on the face of it sounds a little bit weird and the next thing is with one of his wives who was a concubine an unendowered wife she was um, from the Canaanite town of Shechem. She also bare a son and called his name Abimelech, Abimelech, my father, the king. It, what? <laughs> <laughs> is this just uh, maybe, you know, the, the, the games you play with your lover, the daydreams, the fantasies? What will we call him, dear? Oh, let's call him my son. No, my father, the king. Oh, that sounds <laughs> me. That's something. Whatever's going on here. Kind of Caesar-y. Yeah. It's, it's, again, it smacks of this idea of dynasty building. Well, before that goes very far, Gideon dies. And we're told, and this is at the end of chapter 8, that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam, and they made Baal Barith their god. Now, Barith is the word for covenant. Mm-hmm. So they're taking covenant, the biblical concept, and they're, which is very eminently personal, and mm -hmm. they're binding it into Baalism, nature worship. This has got to be a weird hybrid of something. Um, but Baal, notice the word Baal comes first. So it's some kind of synchronistic religion that's drawing on both, or at least drawing on, on Yahweh worship somehow only with words. Um, and it says, the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown unto Israel. And chapter 9 brings us to a story that we often skip over because it's not about any of the judges and it seems kind of a sidelight. And, and, and there's nobody in this story we really like very much. Um, I don't know how many times I was taught this story as a kid, uh, probably once. But what happens, and this, this builds the theme here, um, this boy, Abimelech, or this young man now, Abimelech, who is the son of Gideon by this concubine, she's from Shechem, that is from a Canaanite community, and he goes to Shechem and to his mother's family and communes with them and says this, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether is it better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. Is Shechem the city where Dinah was raised? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. This, this city has a history. Yeah, you know, a history <laughs> of wanting to submit to a good leader who then takes advantage of them. And, um, yeah, this is also where uh, Jeroboam will bring Israel to defy Rehoboam when the kingdom hmm. divides. So this this it goes all the way back to the patriarchs and all the way forward for for a lot of things. But no, notice the play here. He goes to his fam his mom's family, who are to one degree or another Canaanites or intermarried with the Canaanites. First of all, what he says. Is it better for you that all of Gideon's sons reign over you, that is 70 people, or that just one? Notice the, the assumption here. The Gideon's sons are going to reign over you. Mm -hmm. But how many, do you really want 70 rulers? Isn't a monarchy eminently preferable to a very large <laughs> aristocracy or oligarchy? He's arguing forms of government, and he's arguing it on personal prejudice because he says, remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. <laughs> they're, these, these people, they're compromised Israelites. I mean, let's have, um, let's have Canaanitism, let's have Baalism pure and straight up. 
You, you want a Canaanite? I got Canaanite blood. Wouldn't that be much better than having these guys? Mm. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of the men of Shechem, all these words. And their, their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, he's our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces, 70 pieces of silver, out of the house of Baal-Bareth, the temple of this god of theirs, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. So <laughs> he's in the pay of this false god. Yeah. And he's hiring a bunch of sycophants. Yeah, you got it. Okay. Because that works and makes it. What we're seeing here is God drawing a mocking picture of how politics works once God mm -hmm. is taken out of the picture. What do you do? You want a lot of yes men. You want a lot of glamour. You want a lot of outward approval. You want the existing powers to back you. Remember that Baal is a silent God. He doesn't, he's not really going to come and tell you what to do. You can be his mouthpiece. So that's good. <laughs> and he went into his father's house in Oprah and slew his brother and the sons of Jerubbabel, Gideon, being three score and 10 persons upon one stone. So he commits mass murder or human sacrifice, depending on how you look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he told them, you just want one ruler, right? Yeah, one ruler. Good. I'll go kill everyone else. And does. Uh, but one one young man escapes. His name is Jotham. Um, and he breaks in with a story. And I'm just we're gonna talk about that story next time. It's a fantasy story about trees that talk and engage in politics and worship God. And the gist of the story is the trees go out to make a king. And they come to one fruitful plant after another. They go to the olive and they go to the the grapevine. And the fig tree, I think. And at each point they say, come and reign over us. And all the trees say, what? <laughs> Why should I leave my fruitful occupation? Fruitful, huh? And, um, <laughs> and, and go and rule over you. In other words, I, God has appointed me a mission here, a calling in life. I got better things to do than be your king. Go away. And so one by one, the trees get rejected. No one wants to be their king because all of the cool people have stuff to do. They have jobs. They have things that are productive. Finally, they come to the bramble bush. Now, I've never met a bramble bush. And when I was a kid in our backyard, both, both at home and at the school, we had these large blackberry bushes, which were pretty brambly. They were sticky and it was hard to get through them. But at least at a certain time of the year, you could go out and you could get blackberries and make blackberry jelly or whatever from them. So once during the year, they were very nice. The rest of the time, they were just a mess and they were impossible to get rid of. You really had to burn them down. Um, and then they, they'd still come back. These are something else. These are things that are just sticky and thorny and they serve no purpose that we understand uh, in terms of, of agriculture and such. They just grow and take over. They're low to the ground. Um, but they go, the, the trees go to the bramble and say, come thou and reign over us. And the bramble said unto them, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. Okay. Brambles don't have much of a shadow. <laughs> you have yeah. to get pretty low before yeah, you're in the shadow. To, you have to lower, lower yourself <laughs> lower than the bramble to get in the shadow. So asking, the bramble asking them to trust his shadow is kind of like, go crawl around in the, in the ground so I feel good about myself. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. And if you won't do that, well, then let me be the source of the fire that takes you all down. Now, that makes more sense with the rest of the story. Uh, Abimelech is the bra he's a bramble man. He's worthless. He's got <laughs> nothing going. He's not. He's a he's career a, politician. He's never a had career. a job in his life. <laughs> exactly. He wants power for the sake of power. And these these people are coming and asking him to be king. And what Jotham is telling him in his little fairy tale is, this is not going to come out the way you think it is. He's going to be the source of fire that burns down all of this. He's going to take you all down with him. Because that's what these guys do. So I've warned you. Bye. And runs off. And we'll talk, I say we'll talk more about the story later. The outcome is, of course, exactly that. I don't think we need to, to walk through it. But eventually, 
the, the trust between Abimelech and the Canaanites breaks down and battle starts. And uh, Abimelech is able to press his, his military advantage, what little he has. And, but in the end, he does something really stupid. He goes up to a wall <laughs> and this nameless woman drops a stone on his head, which kills him, but not instantly. He has enough breath left to say to his armor bearer, run me through so people will not say a woman killed me. And he dies <laughs> at the hand of his armor bearer. The only other time Abimelech is mentioned in the entire Bible is when David's communicating back and forth with Joab. And Joab reports Uriah's death and says, it's because we went too near the wall. David says, why did you go, near so, the, go so near the wall? Don't you remember Abimelech, the son of Gideon, how he <laughs> went too near the wall and a woman dropped a stone and broke his head? What were you thinking? <laughs> So even his last valiant jester completely failed. No one cared that a woman dropped a stone on his head and crushed his skull. <laughs> uh, and so, and so, you know, messianic overtones there. Um, but that brings us back then to this idea of Brambleman. Dr. Rush Juni, in his book, um, Bread Upon the Waters, this little collection of... Uh, uh, articles he wrote for farm newspapers back in the sixties, I think. He has a tie. He has a little chapter called "Bramble Men," and this is just one line: "The producer produces, and the bramble man seeks power by hurting, restraining, or killing the producer." We got a lot of bramble men going on right now. A lot of bramble people running the federal, state, and county governments. And the solution is not to go assassinate them. Something I have to remind my students from time to time. <laughs> it's, it's, it's easy to be caught up in the extremes of conservatism and patriotism. And um, you're not taking me down. You're going down with me. That's the whole point is that the good trees are not destructive. They're productive. They produce. They're they busy produce with other things. things. <laughs> they have better things to do. Yeah. And and sometimes this is frustrating for Christian activists because some, sometimes God's people need to stand up and be counted and, and pass a political measure or vote for a candidate or some such thing. But that's not how the kingdom comes. That Those mm -hmm. things have their place here and there now and then. But most of us who are productive have lives. We're busy, mm -hmm. for instance, in your case, having babies, getting married, uh, starting careers, Finding your calling before God and then working real hard uh, 40, 50, 60 hours a week to do something for the kingdom of God. And you come home and do something like a podcast with the hopes that we will bless other people with the things that we know and that we've learned. And we really don't have time to go out to political protests. Yeah, put a, put a petition in front of me, I'll sign it. But I'm not going to be the one who goes out there and spends lots and lots of energy initiating it. I'm sure God calls some people to that. Mm -hmm. But most people have jobs, callings, careers, lives, families, church, Bible studies. And that's the focus of this thing, that Bramble people want to bring down the productive and just, well, what Brambles do, ensnare them, catch them up in their process, in their way of doing things, snag them. Uh, if you ever walk through a bunch of brambles or, or blackberries, you just get everything gets caught, everything gets scratched. <laughs> yeah. It's not it's not something you really want to do, and it's better if we just were to set them aside and burn them, or let them be set aside and die. But unfortunately, brambles have a way of growing unless at some point you start snipping. But again, that's side work. Mm -hmm. A farmer's main work is not going out and snipping brambles. He doesn't go out and cut down and burn all the brambles and say, well. <laughs> we're now set for the we're set for for harvest now. It's a side job. It's something you do along the way as you have to. The main thing is planting the seed and growing the crops and harvesting it. Mm -hmm. And so it is for Christians generally. Our main work is to labor with patience in the thing that God has given us. And some political activists have a problem with that. They don't get why well, you share my values. Why aren't you out there? Okay. <laughs> I don't get off until three, six, ten, whatever. And then I have to take my kids to this and to that. And there's a doctor's appointment. And I need to get home and make supper because I got five kids. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. 
But but this is more important. Can't they starve? Can't you stop at McDonald's along the way? No, that's not the kind of No, life Mrs. I want. Jellybee, they cannot. <laughs> oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Would you explain that for the for the sake oh. of people who may not recognize it? Yeah, there's a character in Charles Dickens' book Bleak House named Mrs. Jellybee who is very concerned about the orphans in Africa. And uh, so she goes about raising money for the orphans in Africa. Um, this is, of course, in the Victorian era. And she's wearing these huge hoop skirts that swirl about her. They're like twice as big as anybody else's hoop skirts. And it's kind of a picture of where her focus is. It's so far from herself that her children are sort of like stuffed in her pockets and she's completely forgotten about them. They're just sort of hanging on as best they can. They're sort of shriveled and sad. And because she's so busy thinking about Africa that she's not seeing her own children. Um, oh her focus God. is out at the rim of her skirt and not in her own pockets. And the children really are hungry and mm -hmm. lacking decent clothing and lacking an education. Forsaken by their mother. Forsaken the orphans by their in mother the truest because sense. she loves the heathen so much. And of course, mm -hmm. the ironic thing is what little snips we get about the heathen from her are completely wrong. Mm -hmm. She's completely out of touch with what's really going on in Africa and who these people really are. But she has her her pet ideas, and she devotes so much energy to this, and yet her primary responsibilities she loses. So, yeah, it's a sad, it's a sad picture, and unfortunately, there are people within the church, and certainly within the conservative circles, who are like that, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then they have trouble understanding. You no, know, God wants us to be busy building, not busy attacking. There's a time to attack, but. It's not very often, and we mostly have stuff to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the bottom line for tonight. Yeah. Well, that leads me to a good recommendation. I'm not sure if I've mentioned it before. I feel like it must be impossible for me not to have. Um, but Jordan Peterson's book, 12 <laughs> Rules for Life, which is largely an acknowledgement of this idea that if you want to make the world a better place, Clean up your room. Stand up straight with your shoulders back. Uh, figure out yourself. Set yourself in order before you start criticizing the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, he he argues in really interesting ways from the Bible <laughs> while really trying hard not to say anything that sounds actually Christian. So he's well, one of these these celebrities that I'm praying for. <laughs> he seems really close to becoming a Christian, and I know well, he's got good Christian friends God. around. Yeah. Uh, good Christian friends around him. So yeah. Yes, Jordan Peterson is a, a very intriguing personality that I that I really do love and respect, and, and I, I do hope he he comes to saving knowledge. Um, I, I feel like the the biggest obstacle in that is the fact that he is Jungian. Jungian. And mm. So, scripture is not special revelation from a God that is entirely outside of nature and creation itself and self-existent and all good and all the things that we confess. It's, well, these are all the things that they've lasted long because there's something in them in our evolutionary makeup that makes them resonate with reality. And that's why it's important. Which However, is that's a, very, a view that the Holy Spirit can change. <laughs> it is. And I am very glad for the Spirit's ability to overcome any obstacle. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, what I'm going to recommend is the book that my wife and I, which is an amazing thing I get to say now, <laughs> um, have been going through for our morning devotions. And we actually started it before we became husband and wife, but um, it is it is phenomenal. Uh, it is called The Apostles' Creed, A Guide to the Ancient Catechism. It's written by Ben Myers, M-Y-E-R-S. And basically, it is a I, – I have a feeling he's Anglican just by the way that he talks about things. <laughs> but um, he, he takes the Apostles' Creed line by line mm -hmm. and explores what – First, you know, practically and literally that phrase in the creed means, but then also what it implies about reality and the Christian worldview. Mm. Um, and he quotes very heavily from church fathers as well to kind of bolster 
his claims as um as something that's not you know something historical as opposed to ahistorical mm-hmm. um and we just finished it two days ago i think and it's it's phenomenal it's really good i'd recommend it to anyone it works really great as a devotional book that you can read alongside your scripture readings for the the morning or the evening mm-hmm. and there's a couple other books in this series we just started this the uh, one of the second ones which is the ten commandments um and peter lightheart actually wrote that one i'm normally mm-hmm. very wary about anything <laughs> peter lightheart <laughs> says but so far this has been very good <laughs> um I would say just probably for that one, just you know, discernment, yeah. discernment shields up. And uh, <laughs> there's another one. I forget who wrote the other one, but there's also a, a short one on the Lord's Prayer as well. And I again, it's just say, I bet the third one's on the Lord's Prayer. Probably there's probably more than those three. Those are just the three that Emily owns. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, a nice tip of the hat to the Heidelberg Catechism, which analyzes the faith in terms of those guilt, grace, things. and gratitude. And um, in ter- also in terms of guilt, guilt. there's a nod to the law of God. But then um, it, it begins with the creed. What, what is it? What, what do Christians believe anyway? What is true faith all about? What, what is it we believe? Um, and then when it goes to thankfulness, then it comes back to the law of God as a means of thankfulness uh, mm. and then to prayer. And particularly using the Lord's Prayer as the model. Um, my recommendation, as I sit here looking at your faces, is I'm going to recommend marriage. <laughs> marriage is a good thing. <laughs> uh, I see it reflected in both of you now, and it is a uh, not a warm and fuzzy feeling. It is a glow of eternity. It is the fruit of the Spirit working in your lives. It's a hard thing. And there will be many <laughs> challenges for both of you in your in your relationships, that does not make it a bad thing or something you ever give up on. But it is something that God will use to sanctify you and to forward his kingdom. And you know, now you have partners who can help you and stand beside you and hold you up and be there when you're sick and with whom you will, God willing, produce many fruitful children who will take some of who you are and some of who their teachers and their pastors and their friends and their relatives are, and will forward that into the next generation. And therefore, marriage is to be taken very seriously, as you both and your spouses have both uh, taken it. I know too many who want the fruit of a marriage. They want the, the sexual experience or the companionship or someone to value them. But in missing the heart of God's will for marriage, they're setting themselves up for a lot of trouble. So is marriage, all my former students, should you get married? Unless God says no, he's already said yes. So what are you waiting <laughs> on? Um, it does not say that you have to be hopelessly head over heels in love with per- with a person you marry, although you should like them a lot. <laughs> it's a good idea. It's a good idea, but more, you should share a common faith in Jesus Christ. You should mm-hmm. both love Jesus. And if that's there, a lot of things are possible. If that's mm-hmm. not there... I was one of my other earlier students once said, how could I love somebody who hates my best friend mm. when your best friend is God? So, yeah. So yep. marriage what brings mm. us together in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take this opportunity then to uh, make explicit something you implied already. And that is that David, our producer and my lawfully wedded husband, and I are expecting our first child in a few months here. <laughs> Which I don't think exciting. we've mentioned on the podcast <laughs> oh, before. <laughs> so I don't well, know. We've just kind of been chill about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's it's like every part of life is harder right now because of pregnancy. <laughs> so like whatever can stay the same, if we can make it stay the same, that's good. <laughs> so the podcast has just kept on trucking. Uh, but we're very excited and uh, we will keep you posted, listeners. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thank you, Thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Uh, hope you're edified by uh, these conversations as we are in having them. 
Uh, if you'd like to get in touch with us, join in on this conversation, please do. Uh, you can reach us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, any of your favorite podcast catchers. Uh, you can still follow me on Goodreads, although I'm not reading a lot because I'm busy. Um, <laughs> I know the feeling. <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, thank you also. Huge thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Yeah, I, I can't say enough good things about the editing software that we are able to pay for because of your generous contributions. Um, we'll let you mention it. It's good because I, I know at least one or two of our financial supporters. Mm -hmm. Very good. It's not that they have a ton of money, but they think this is important. So thank you very much for what you've done for us mm -hmm. and for yes. the people who listen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion. Uh, we also theoretically have show notes there. I have fallen behind in writing the show notes. <laughs> um, we're working on that. We're working on it. Uh, thank you for bearing with us over these crazy past several months. Um, yeah, once again, just thank you for listening, and we'll see you next week. Bye.